Tung, 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 tung. <laughs> hey, we're back, guys. Hey, ladies hey. and gentlemen. That's Omar Gonzalez. I'm Mo Morales. This here is the Mo and O Photo Show, where hey, we talk about up? everything. Is Don't let like the name forced, fool you. Are you are you doing forced positivity right now? Yes, we love everything. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you what I watched yesterday that that was like? Um, it just made me sadder and sadder as I continued to watch it, and it was two hours long. Wow, you actually watched it for two hours? Yeah, it was going to be one of those. I give usually I give things about twenty minutes. I'm like, if you hook me in the first fifteen to twenty minutes, I'll stay with you. Like either a movie or mostly a documentary. It was inside the mind of robin williams you know i have seen that come across my face and never hit play right me too and i was i was kind of like devastated when robin williams died because i uh, from mork and mindy mork and mindy aladdin uh there were so many things that helped shape me because i mean for i mean i cut you off and i apologize but after mork and mindy i loved them and then for my childhood, my children's, my child, my children's, my child's uh, ch- childhood, the movie Aladdin is like so key. I watched that like a, thr- a trillion times with him, you know? Robin Williams was one of the first like celebrity voices to do, he started a whole movement of Disney voices being, like the movie sucks, but if you get like Chris Rock and David Schwimmer mm-hmm. and you know, you get names to put on there, your movie will do well. And right. that's what Robin Williams, he didn't really want to be recognized for that movie so much. And uh, he started a whole wave of celebrity voices. And I thought you only get famous people doing right. voiceovers. And some of them are just, they shouldn't be doing, <laughs> they shouldn't no. be doing cartoons. They're, they're really like, where's the check? Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the check. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I watched Robin Williams and I was, uh, as it went on, it was just like wow, seeing him as Mork and Mindy, seeing him uh, as you know his c- comedic act. I remember just being shocked how like sexual he was. He right. was like definitely, yeah. Uh, he wasn't Mork, that's for no, sure. No, 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 definitely when he did the you know from live from San Francisco and stuff like that. He he was definitely like uh, uh, Eddie Murphy ish, you know. Yeah, and, but without as much cursing, you know. And then it got sadder and sadder because it, you realize that he loved to be on stage and was on stage and he was taking more of these like dramatic roles. Mm-hmm. And a, a, a lot of people behind the scenes said that, you know, even while he was, when the cameras were off during these dramatic roles, he would just be making people laugh like behind the scenes. And then when they said roll them, he would just like go back to his, you know, he always had to be performing and on stage. And I think the later movies that he made were like kind of weak. And mm-hmm. I, um, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, yeah. Towards the end of his life, he had a lot of stuff going on that he kept to himself. And and when they, um, I did, I, I watched, I did watch, uh, because I watched those true crime shows and I watched the autopsy of Robin Williams and mm. you know they they delved into everything that was wrong with his brain you know which it's it's something that a lot of comedians deal with the the excessive need to be funny to be yeah. appreciated to be loved for being funny and i thought that you know what this guy was carrying so many with the weight of the world doubled upon himself you know yeah so i watched that and i was hooked hooked and Towards the end, it got sadder and sadder and sadder because you saw where you know where the story ends. Right, right. And uh, I think he was probably the most shocked I've been when a celebrity died. Him and Prince were maybe the t- top two where I was like, "Oh no," you know. No, no, I, I understand that. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is like I had watched uh, a couple of behind the lives on on those like reels channel with um, uh, Chris Farley and Richard Pryor. And I realized that 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 need to be funny and in front of people, it, it becomes a bigger drug than most real drugs. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And then and then you know you don't deal with life as well when you're not on, when you're not funny, when there's not people around you. Like behind closed doors, they're very very like sad lives. Sad, yeah. very sad. Introvert and also yeah. the the 
the lights go down you know they're kind exactly. of then the, 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 the one person depression. shows up though it's like whoo yeah it's, it's time yeah. to turn it on totally all right so welcome to the mo and o photo show the downer episode ah i mean i'm sorry mm. <laughs> mm. and so today on today's episode we are going to discuss uh i watched this video dude from um, Street Snappers, excellent okay. YouTube video. His name is Brian Lloyd Dutchell, and he's a, uh, just like an experienced street photographer that gives great real advice. And I watched his video on reducing fear in street photography, and I thought it was so good. We're gonna link it up below and share it, but I thought it'd be a fun discussion to touch on some of the points that he brought up and give our perspective on it. So we're totally stealing his idea. Right, because it's, it's also, it, it's the whole subject is very important to understand that at certain levels, most levels, there is a fear. There's some times where you have that moment of anxiety. Yeah. You, the fear never truly goes away. It might become easier. It might become easier to deal with because you're at a comfort level. But yeah, fear from the very beginning until the end. And then what creates that fear? But we'll delve into that. Yeah, totally. And I, I, it must be so common because any talk or YouTube video or seminar I see, like everyone always asks, how do you photograph strangers? And I, I think that most of us, I know me personally, the, the street photograph, the street photographs that we feel we want to get the most of are little stories, mm -hmm. almost as if the, the one frame you captured, you can hang up and people will stare at it for a while because it has stuff going on that's interesting. And I think the first thing is, the first thing you have to realize is that that's really hard to do. Like you have to be somewhat very lucky and shoot a lot to get a capture, which is a serendipitous moment or some kind of story. I think most of the street photography we do is capturing street life. Or, exactly. you know what I'm saying? Exactly. The norm every the day. Norm. Just, just your your event, your view of it, you know? If you get that moment where, you know, you have six people looking up and two people looking straight ahead, that's that's a nice capture. That's a yeah, story. Yeah, it's a story. You look at that photograph, you're like, like what's why, going why, on Why are they looking up? Yeah. So, <laughs> but you don't get a lot of those. You, you no. normally have to tell a story of the mundane, but the mundane can still be interesting. It's just not as interesting as a story photo. You know. Yeah, and I think a lot of my fear before we start talking about the points that were brought up, I think a lot of my fear comes from that, that there is this goal and this little bit of stress to find the shot as I walk around. Part of my like built up anxiety comes from trying to capture really great, compelling photographs. And um, I think that's like part of my fear is that I know that the best and compelling photographs usually come from being next to people, close to people, and capturing their story. And that is like the hardest, most anxious type of photography, I think. Exactly, especially if, if you're not comfortable with the uh, interaction that may occur, you know? Heck yeah. All right, so here's, how, here's some of the stuff he said. So Brian was talking about building your confidence on the street. And part of the confidence, uh, ha like while you do street photography, comes from minimizing your fear. And he spoke about how like we all do have fear and we have to sort of understand where this fear is coming from. And if you wanna be a better street photographer, here's point one that Mo and I will talk about. What type of street photographer do you think you could be? So you could have cityscape, you could have, you know, like, are you focusing on people? Are you focusing on stories? Are you focusing on an object that just jumps out at you? And then you like, you, you, uh, you do the Fuji F-16 super close up on it, but you have enough <laughs> of the background to tell a story. Like, you know, yeah, there's, there's layers of it. And what makes you happy? What makes you comfortable? That's what you have to first find. Yeah, it's what fits your style. So if you're an introvert and shy, then maybe it's okay to do street photography with a person being smaller in the frame. I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. Do you think that someone might be feeling like they miss out though? Again, going back to the anxiety of, damn, those street pictures that are so good are so close with a 35, you know? So so then that person's answering his own question. I don't. That person is saying that shooting with a 16 millimeter halfway down the block at this and getting such a small human 
isn't what he wants. He wants yeah. to get into the nitty gritty That's of it. So then, so he then that he or she will then need to develop the comfort zone to get there. Totally. And maybe it starts with what you said. Maybe 16 and small human in the frame until you feel like you have that down. That's what Brian said in one of his points, that, that whatever you do, do it from an extreme and move it into where you want to end up. I think that maybe if, if the street photography is causing you to be so anxious because you want to be something that you can't, that's a conversation you have to have with yourself. Yeah, that's a come to me moment. We have to sit yourself down and say, listen, this is what you want. But unless you're I'm ready to cross this line, I'm never going to get. I know. Are you going to have an ulcer like every time you go out? Oh, I remembered what I was going to say. A lot of the stuff we're talking about gets better the more you go out there, just like any skill. And I think if you shot street photography just like every day you went out, like if it was a job, damn, imagine how many moments you will see and right. learn how to anticipate, you know? Exactly. So if street photography is something you love, you can't get better from your couch. It's one yeah. of those things. Or even like what we do, we're kind of like weekend warrior street photographers. I feel that I haven't improved enough on street photography because I don't go out enough. I'm talking, it has to be something just like as, if it's a job, it's like every day you go out during your lunch. And so I think those people really get good fast. Right because they find out what works for them, you know? Uh, all right, cool, Let me. that was awesome, that was awesome. Let me move to the next part. The next thing is that uh, Brian mentioned are try to discover or think about if your fears are actually rational. What are you afraid of? Right, right. Are you afraid of the confrontation? Are you afraid of taking the picture to begin with like should i be doing this yeah um, and then and then within that sublet is like if you're feeling that way why are you feeling that way right um so are, is the first fear the fear of confrontation so are you now chosen to do photography that involves people do you feel that i'm taking this photo of this this angry looking man is he going to come over here and punch me in his oh, face oh yeah I'm is this totally, woman going to totally... slap me and tell me stop that and put that down that's my woman's voice you like that <laughs> yeah so i i think my fears are rational because <laughs> uh i mean his brian's uh, argument was like what's the worst that can happen and i always feel like the worst that can happen is i make someone feel bad mm -hmm. and i took a picture of a vendor he was more upset that I was taking picture of his like work, but the guy looked cool. Like he had his his uh, New York paintings there, and he was looking off to the side. So I just did a quick, you know, a quick grab with my camera, and he saw it. Like, and he's probably so like his radar of tourists taking pictures of his stuff is always like <laughs> is always on. Right. So he came right up to me and confronted me. So. I think I always have that in the back of my mind that I made someone feel uncomfortable where I just wanted to take a picture because they look cool, but I kind of ruined his day and he ruined my day. You know what I mean? But that person would have, you didn't make him feel uncomfortable. You threatened him with, are you stealing his intellectual property? Yeah. And yeah. that's what that's what those tourists do. A lot of tourists do is they take pictures of that stuff that they'll then blow up themselves, you know? Yeah, you're and right. That's, and that's, that was his thing. Like, listen, bro. Don't be taking food out of my mouth, man. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, you're right. And and so. I probably should have had that radar on. Like, I was just concentrating on how he was leaning on the wall, he like being cool. a portrait photographer. He looked cool. You got yeah. that moment. And he made you delete it, right? Yeah, he made me delete it. And he was like a, you know, a few inches from my nose and stuff. But, mm. you know, that's New York. And you got to kind of be ready for that, too. And I think part of it, and we've talked about this in the past, is that I was sneaky, sneaky. Yeah, you did the old, yeah, the old hand and if, around and sneaky stuff. Instead snap. of, you know, it, it it becomes that juggle, right? Because you mm. want to capture moments that are that are authentic. You don't like, in my personal opinion, I don't want to stop and be like, eh, can I take your <laughs> picture? Huh? May I? May I? Nice. And then he'll shake his head no, but like that doesn't matter anyway because the way he was leaning and looking, it's not going. Know, and, you know, in the back of my mind, that picture would have sucked anyway. It's not the type of street photography I wanted to do. That was kind of like a vendor portrait mm -hmm. in my mind. Do you understand? Right. It wasn't like there was a cool moment going on, which is what I'm always trying to capture. 
And so it ruined my day because it was like the picture wasn't that great to begin with. I've ruined the guy's day and now I'm like depressed. <laughs> right. You know? You're dealing with that level of anxiety that now has tripled because it your your fear has been realized. You know, the my confrontation. fear has been realized. So like Brian's argument was like, what's the worst that can happen? Well, I've, you know, that I kind of feel like I've have already felt someone in the- your face is is <laughs> confrontational, uh, Brian. That that's 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 what's going to happen. But he's right in to say he's right in the next point. And here's Brian's next point. When you're doing street photography and I love this point is your mindset should be that you really aren't doing anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with you trying to capture and take pictures. It's something that's common and normal and we've been doing for so long that I think most of the wrongness comes from our end of the camera than what people think of you. Right, and and with that point he mentioned, if you seem to be doing something wrong, you're going to give off that (laughs) feeling and then the person confronting you will confront you for that specific reason. Like, hey, yeah. hey, you look shady over there. What are you doing? Why are you yeah. taking my picture? And I my feel picture. shady. I'm feeling shady. You know, right. So. And then now they call you out. So now, there we go. Multiplication of anxiety. You yeah, know? it's funny. If you see all the all the factors and the parts, it starts to make more sense. You know, like um, he mentioned that if, if you walked around with like an inner smile instead of like the hunt, like the lion on the hunt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. One thing I started doing, and I, I don't know if, if you're going to touch on this, but one of the things I started doing since I've been going out almost every week and I could prior to being sick, um, I've been just keeping the camera up to my face, bringing it up, putting it down, bringing it up, putting it down, so that people around me, mm. whether they're looking at me or not, if they do look my way, will notice, oh, that's what he's been doing the whole time. He's just yeah. getting ready to take a shot, so I'll just get out of his way. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not it's not a solid answer to taking the shot but i also felt that that helps prep everybody you know mm. that way there's less of it's a, a normal activity you're, right you're I, i'm it up blending your... because this is what i do i blend yeah. <laughs> naturally like a like a cheetah yeah so i i totally loved his point that like it's a mindset of you know what i'm coming out here and i'm capturing life don't you you will give off the vibe of not doing anything wrong and i totally agree with that and it brought up, it brings up the next point. His next point was, okay, you're not doing anything wrong, but there are lines where it starts to be wrong. And this enters a discussion of what are your ethical beliefs of when you do street photography? Okay, so I'm not the shove a camera in people's face photographer, right? Yeah, me um, neither. I don't shoot homeless unless it's accidental. Me neither. Um, I don't shoot women well, who are like you. Oops, I fell over. Oops, I took, I a, fell I took, over I took again. a photo. I took a photo of a food cart about a year or so ago. I posted it, not realizing that there was a homeless guy in mm. the far background. I've since taken that photo and cropped it in, so he's not part of the photo. But yeah, you can in in New York City. It's not impossible to accidentally take a shot of a homeless person. Oh, listen, I go through. I've been going through, as you know, my old catalog, and I have pictures of homeless people in San Francisco, and you know they are the human element in some of your you know photographs, and mm-hmm. I just don't show them or don't. You know, I think I was more into, uh, you know, showing that that it's part of the city. Right, but you got to think of the person too. So, like ethically, uh, I'm not a fan. I think most street photography shun away from right that. Yeah, the, the per- it's not people respected. who do it, right? People who do it on a regular basis try to avoid that. People who are just delving into it. Because when I first started, I'm not going to be hypocritical and say I never took pictures of homeless people. I did too. Yeah. When I, when I first got started, I thought it was the cool thing to do. We also then, shot on on train tracks and train uh, tracks. you know all the tropes. Yeah. Yeah. So these are things that you you learn I either to grow up and away from, or or and you know absorb and, and make it part of who you are. I'm I don't judge you if you post people in that position. I I just choose not to. I also will not shoot a a, a woman who's not dressed appropriately, you know, because I know it'll get likes on my Instagram or whatever like Mm -hmm. that, you know? There's a lot of people who, you know, want to take a scantily picture of a woman and and make it look all like, uh, you know, sneaky. And I think that's, I think that's shameful in itself too. Same thing with men. Like if I see a a hot man with his six packs ab out, (laughs) I don't pull out my hot butter, <laughs> you know. Sir may, sir, may I ab, uh, put some butter on your abs real quick? No, no. Well, I was I think... gonna say, you know, 
you know what else is becoming a little bit of a a trope slash common thing that I think street photographies are starting to be like, come on, man, uh, people on their phones. Mm-hmm. It's an easy target to get someone because people are distracted when they're on their phones. So they're like easy pickings. They're the weak wildebeests and you're the exactly, lion. Exactly. You know, so having having a cool scene that the story is someone on their phone uh, is starting to become a little tropey. I think I think people are past that already, you know? They, they, I got plenty of those in my collection. You can't help but get those, though, because that's all people are, right? We're, we're now sheep of the phone. So it's, it's, it's harder to not get that shot than it is to get that shot. Yeah, you know, it'd be cool is if you had, like, like what you said, everyone's looking up at something exciting happening and the, the moron on the end is like, mimic, mimic, <laughs> on his phone. I love my you phone. Know? My phone is my baby. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that would be cool. Someone with, mom with their baby, dude with his phone. <laughs> See, if you can, if you can work it into being like, you know, something artistic. Exactly. So, uh, great point by Brian as far as ethics goes. If you're doing something that feels kind of wrong his point is it probably is wrong so shooting the homeless or maybe um you know something where you're exploiting someone that shouldn't be exploited or if you're sneaking up on you know like small children stop it yeah first of all don't take pictures of any child that's not yours that's my universal warning to you you yeah i have I have, but I try as much as possible, like to chop their head off in the photo or show the back of them. I I, I will take my statement a, a step back. You're correct. I took a photo of a father and son with uh with only the back of the child's face. I, my my point. Let me rephrase my point. Is don't take pictures of kids' faces and post them. That's 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 first. It's not your kid, and two, it's irresponsible. Yeah, that's yeah. my I've theory. Done it. I've that's actually my done theory. it. I've I've I uh, guiltily should probably work on that a little bit more because um i used to do kid photography i love babies and kids and stuff so um i have a picture of a little a little baby like looking back super dramatic that i have Mm -hmm. in my like street photography but you're right i'm wondering that's a good ethical discussion and 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 and, and the thing about ethics omar is your line determines what you consider ethical yeah, yeah. So we could tell you everything here that we think is ethical, and you could be sitting there at home going, like, these guys are morons. So you probably yeah, be yeah. that way anyway. But I think, honestly, you have to find what you feel is ethical, not what no, we think it, is what we're telling you is ethical. No, no. But look, it, just like Brian said, if it feels wrong, it probably is. And you know what? Photographing kids does feel a little wrong. Like what you mm-hmm. said, um, even though it's a cute kid or they're doing something fun, uh, it's – It's a little weird because when you look at old black and white New York, there's kids playing on the street, right? right? That's a different world, though. That's a different world. No, what's the difference of like kids opening up a hydrant in the summer in the Bronx and you take a picture of the kids splashing around? I think if you take a picture of a group of kids and they're all doing something, that's one thing. If you take a picture of one Uh, child and you post it, that's just creepy. I I have pictures of kids with their parents and they're looking at me. I, I'll post those that I've taken in the streets or at a fair somewhere. And the person saw me taking the picture. We laughed. I showed them the picture. I sent them a copy months later or whatever. Um, so there's there's different levels of, of posting yeah, yeah. children. I just think in, in today's world of, you know, we won't get into it, but, you know, so many kidnappings of kids and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's just crazy. And I think no, I, the, agree. I agree. I think protecting the children is key by, by, by minimizing their exposure. Cool, cool. All right, and then Brian says, also know when you're going out there to know what your legal rights are. Every mm-hmm. country is different. You should definitely know if someone's like, you have to delete that photo. Uh, personally, I would if someone's like in your face. Uh, but if a cop comes up to you and says, you can't take pictures here, you know, know your rights. You know Exactly. Like if the cop tells me you can't take pictures here and he doesn't tell you to delete them, just walk away. <laughs> say yeah. okay you're right and then keep what you got and keep it moving son yeah yeah he can't make you delete photos if you're like in times square taking photos um now should you take pictures of police officers while they're working they always look cool in their gear and stuff so um i always like having cops i've taken street photos of cops but i've been sneaky sneaky I haven't. and I, that's I've a little asked. dangerous yeah i've asked 
I've asked. Uh, a couple of months ago, I, I was in Times Square and I saw these two, three cops lined up and I straight up said, hey, do you mind? And they're like, nah, and actually they got extra cooler, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. But then then you're doing street po- cop portraits. It doesn't matter to me at that moment, you know? No, it doesn't it, matter you, but no, to me, me as matter. a world famous street photographer that captures moments. Oh, so you're Captain Candid. All right. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, I, I like whatever has the word street in front of it. If it's street portrait, street photography. Yeah. You know, so to me, I, I just want to get a nice shot on the street. Cool, cool. I was just being an I'll a-hole. still hashtag a street. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. So to minimize your fears, remember, uh, know that you're not doing anything wrong. Know your rights. And the third advice that I don't even know what number we're up to, but the next advice that Brian had, which I love, he said, don't stick out like a sore thumb and don't look like a photo- photographer, like right. a don't, photo don't bring journalist. Out your your uh, Canon Mark D, Mark IV. <laughs> so we should probably talk about if you have anxiety, what are the best kind of cameras to have? And I think... Uh, people start off with their phone, although phone quality for street ah, photos is good like... Good thing you said that. So yeah. no, I, no, no, I think you can get amazing. I have posted many phone photos from my, um, you know, high-end phones. <laughs> but I think people are more turned off by this than yeah. they are by camera. More. I, I mean, I'm not saying that they're not turned off by the camera. But I think if you point your phone at people these days, it's more offensive to them than if you pointed a camera to them. I don't understand the logic behind that, but but I have noticed that as as I've been on the street, I I put my pull my phone out and people are like don't don't. Well, if I put a camera out, they don't make a big deal about anything, you know. No, I could see that, and also like. For example, if you're on a train or something, using mm-hmm. your phone sometimes to take characters, pictures of characters. That's what. That's another thing you should look at when you're on the street is characters. And um, using your phone sometimes is a little dangerous, a very sneaky sneaky. Right, and you're not talking about characters like those Mickey Mouse because don't take their pictures. No, definitely not. They not unless you're going to pay you. them. Don't. And if you're not going to pay them, don't take their pictures. So I think one of the first things you want to do is have lightweight, small gear, right? I have my X-T3 in hand with my 35 millimeter F2 on here. And this is not the most compact kit you can carry out there, but it is a very small kit compared to... To if you brought out your Sony with the 85 millimeter, your yeah. Sony A7 III with your it looks you know, more 85 camera-y. millimeter. To me, I that's would... why I picked up this little girl. Ooh, oh. The Fuji oh. X100F. Because I'm so jealous. <laughs> I, I'm going to carry this around. Um, it's so... Look at, look at this. Even with the with the lens on, it's so small in profile compared... Wait till you see what I got. <laughs> right. You're going to probably pull out a GRH on me, aren't you? <laughs> Actually, I was going to talk about the GR3. I think... Yeah. Uh, either a Sony RX, uh, what are they called? RX X100? 100. Yeah. Uh, some of these 24 megapixel little point and shoot guys just take great black and whites, take great snaps. And you look like such a tourist with a tiny point and shoot, mm-hmm. especially if you, if you have that goofy inner smile going on and you're like looking around. And I think that's probably the highest rate of capture of moments is you just being a tourist and having one-handed snap and you know that kind of thing so a point and shoot small camera might be your thing um i love those life. cameras i love those cameras when i had the rx100 uh bark 3 um i love that camera i i, I when we had the x100s x1 x100s's you and i yeah we, we love those cameras I, I they're so small they're so compact back then the battery life was garbage was that what you're going to just talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so you gar- have you should have at least a couple with you. Minimum. What batteries that guy take? That takes the this one takes this Fuji one takes one. the same one as the XT3. Oh, that's good. It's I the think first the older one, the one yeah. had the small. Yeah. The T, the S, and the regular all take the smaller, like two picture battery. <laughs> it's not even two photos, two pictures, and you're good. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. yeah. Uh, and and we're talking gear and small gear, but for street photography, man, I think like gear may be. The le- it may be the one genre of photography where gear matters least. You know, when you look at all for the quality? great street... Quality. For, for quality, not for stealth. Yeah, for quality. Okay, okay. I okay. think, like, uh, all the great street photographers you see are using dinky cameras, they're using film cameras, they're using taped up, duct taped up cameras, you know? Right, right. And it just has this great... Um, it's just this great genre of use what you have... 
and you could be using old Fujis and old Sonys that are small and, and you could get some great stuff. So Yeah, exactly. Especially because some of those cameras come with the built-in LD filters and just makes life a lot easier for you. Um, but but besides gear, what else can we do to blend in, Omar? Oh, well, I was going to mention one more thing about gear. Oh, okay. Is uh, you should probably just shoot a prime. Like the Mose X100F is a perfect example of where you're limited by just having the 35 millimeter street focal length. I think that's gonna liberate your mind too, so you're not like zooming and worrying about which focal length to have. Plus a zoom lens is like honking, it sticks out from the camera. There's no such thing as a small zoom lens, right? Exactly. Even, even the small zoom lens are still bigger than the most primes. I think we'll end with an interesting discussion. I love that Brian said this in his video. And again, check out the video, we'll link it up below. but. He says that you could use all these techniques that will disguise your street photography and disguise what you're doing out there. And his kind of theory is that you really, if you're confident and you know that you're not doing anything wrong, there really is no reason to disguise what you're doing. Right. And some of the ways you can disguise are you can either shoot from the hip with the flip screen one thing I do is sometimes I have the phone app open. I have a camera app open, and I can use the phone to shoot <laughs> super sneaky. I that love is it. so sneaky. Uh, or other things like pretending you're shooting a movie, and mm -hmm. you can either photograph. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, is it more important to capture the moment that's going on sneakily? I think or that, that, that depends on you as far as where you are, right? Like, are you just breaking in and getting your feet wet and you're just trying to get get it get used to it so then yeah i guess whatever it takes to you get first of all to get out there yeah do, do whatever it takes to get out there and shoot that's the first and most important thing get the shot by any means if you feel like oh my gosh i have to be sneaky or else i won't be able to do this with my nerves then take it sneakily but i think if you do it more often, as Omar said earlier, the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get with it. And you shoot like I shoot nowadays. I rarely shoot from the hip. I rarely shoot um, from the side angle. I, I usually put the camera right to my face and shoot. That's me. That's me nowadays. I'm an ex-Marine. I've seen things. I'm trained yeah. to kill. So fear for me is a little different than it might be for you. So you do what you feel is comfortable to get the shot. That's the most important thing. Pull out your phone, sneak out here, look over here, you know, talk to your girlfriend while you're shooting, you know, you know, rub your dog and shoot this over <laughs> here. Whatever it takes. The most important thing is to get out, do photography and shoot. Yeah, Whatever and I, it takes. I like his argument too that it 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 could confound other things. So if you're being sneaky, well, then that goes back to you the being The trust shady. issue that you're creating to other people. Exactly. Like, why, why you, is he shooting me like this? You start to look more shady. You start to give off the bad vibes. Um, so if maybe you can work, I know I, for, I had a lot of success using the shoot from the hip, use the phone app thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, it, it definitely is an interesting discussion. Is that the right way to do it? So now that back then you did it, you felt good about it. Now, based on this conversation, are you rethinking that method? A little bit. It's or like, I almost like, listen, want, I'm like, what the hell it. am I doing? It, right, you know, I, right. I'm realizing like, if I'm on the street with this connecting the Wi-Fi and the, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Is if I capture something that's good, do I feel good about how I captured it? You know, because you could put a hidden remote camera inside a freaking mailbox and be like, I'm capturing all these moments. <laughs> And no. you may not feel good about that. And right. I think like sort of the sneak, I'm starting to understand that maybe the sneaky, uh, I'd, I'd rather work on being faster and move on than be sneaky and capture moments. So it, it's it's becoming, instead of capturing moments that people will see, I'm, I'm starting to like really think about how I feel about how I shoot on the street. I'm just looking up this guy that I watch all the time. Um... He does street photography with the GR8, uh, GR3. Oh, Samuel Streetwise? Yes, thank you. Love him. So, he, But he also does with the X100F here and there when he picked it up. And I, he, my whole point to what we're saying here is don't listen to us. Obviously, yeah. listen to us, but don't listen to us because we know he's an amazing street photographer and he will sneak a shot whenever it time needs to be, oh, right? Oh, yeah. He will, he will, you know, distract and shoot. So... 
while we're saying what we think, it's it's more important to just shoot. I think that's the key. To don't miss that in everything we're saying here. All right, so the, let's go to a technique that is accepted and will make you feel good and will start you on the right track. Find a composition and park yourself and have characters moving through your composition until you find a character that looks great. Exactly. You know, I've I've... You and I did that once where we were having... We were in a city and Omar and I parked ourselves on this one spot that we liked the way the shadows were falling and we waited and, and Omar got the shot as far as I'm concerned where one, uh, you know a smooth brother just walked through and... He looked cool. And, and, he had and, good color. He was wearing red. Right. It, uh, the lighting on him looked great. It was and, one of those colors, it was photos where he, Omar had to turn color because black and white really didn't do it justice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so. I, I think that's a good technique to make you feel good. Uh, the method is good of capturing it. You're not really that sneaky because you're kind of just parked and sitting somewhere. Right. And maybe that's how you start. And I think that's how I started. I'm ready to move on to the next, which is walking around finding moments. Mm -hmm. Like that is my goal to really start capturing stories. I'm kind of tired of taking the mundane street photography. And again, this will set you up again for disappointment. We've talked about that in the past where you, if you think you're going to get these epic photos and you don't, is it a failure? Right. No, I think, I think, you know, that, that's what you're going to think, but you have to retrain your brain to think that this is in preparation to get in that shot getting that shot everything i'm doing is building my foundation to getting that shot getting because that shot isn't yeah. going to always be there but when it's there you're ready yeah great point great point so street photography techniques street photography ethics street photography uh fear is something that you can you know think about when you go out there each time and and i think it's a great discussion we could each hit tackle each of these for like an hour each so right all right, then. <laughs> An hour each, but like last hour. <laughs> slow, walk slow. Yes, walk slow. So don't don't be fast paced and, and that'll draw attention to yourself. That was it. I just wanted to be weird and random at the end of the video. <laughs> well, you've accomplished it. I am awesome. Guys, <laughs> thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for spending any time with us, whether it's, you know, 15 minutes or the whole entire podcast. We really appreciate what everything that you guys do. And that's why we do it, because we love you guys. Thank so, you for all the great feedback. Yes. Until next time, I've been Mo Morales. And I'm Omar Gonzalez. We'll talk to you. Peace. Uh, uh, uh.